See, so, you- so getting started on our topic for tonight, which is adventure design in the in the in the in the, in the widest sense, uh, Matt was just mentioning uh, off channel that we were kind of like going into the topics already. So why don't we kind of recap where we were there, Matt, and why don't we go ahead and just continue that conversation um, with the, yeah, with sure. the question so, you have for the next segment? Yeah. So uh, that actually flows very well. So formatting my uh, topic for the group. Uh, is how do you format adventures uh, when designing it? And I specifically was going to go to text box uh, flavor text, uh, but since, since we've already kind of beat that horse, how do you go about um, laying out the adventure? I mean, old school. One of my biggest complaints about uh, old school adventures, and one of the funniest moments probably in our in our gaming group was uh, you read the flavor text robotically as the GM. Blah blah blah. There's a room with a treasure chest, and you see the the walls are. 10 feet high, the ceiling is in darkness, and there's a red dragon in the corner, you know, that as he as he reads through the, uh, the excerpt at the end, which is not included in the flavor text at all. So you get through this whole long paragraph, and then, oh yeah, by the way, there's a red dragon. And so uh, uh, how do you go about formatting your adventure when you're writing it to make it easier for game masters? And we'll start with, uh, how about Brian? Brian's a, a pro by now. Shit. At, for, at, at formatting. Um, God, that's a good one, though. Um, so I always like action and excitement in the stuff that I'm writing, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be combat related. I, I want something something fun, something memorable, something something that's propelling the game forward. Uh, does that help? Does that kind of... Sandals. Those were sandals. <laughs> what, 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 what does that look like, though? I mean, are you so I guess if we get into what the how the adventure itself is literally laid out in format. So do you have a big, long uh, immersion text at the beginning? Are you like are you assuming that your players know where they're going to just put it in their campaign? So unlike Rob, I, I, I guess I don't know, but I meet a lot of people who've never really played games before and who are looking at your product and are like, well, I, I don't know. I've never run a game before, but I'd really kind of like to. And, you know, so I feel like maybe I write for a little bit different audience. Um, sure. But at the same time, I want to give them the tools that they need to have confidence in themselves that they can run a game. Right. right? And yet, at the same time, give the veteran GMs those those nuggets of juicy awesomeness that they need to do something amazing that their players will remember forever, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so, you you want your story to be awesome, but it's like Rob mentioned, it's not just the game master's story, it's not just the author's story, and it's not just the player's story, right? It it is a culmination right. of the three. That's yeah, for sure. And I, I kind of feel like the um, I'm not necessarily a fan of reading flavor text, but I, I have mm-hmm. maybe it's a uh, insecurity that people are not going to be able to to uh, interpret what I wanted to put down on when I'm trying to get into the adventure. So I, I include as much uh, as much text as I can to make sure that I kind of cage the game master's head around what what's going on. So yeah. I can guarantee you, Rob would hate uh, would hate dude. Uh, one of my adventures. He's gonna hate everything. Your- it sounds like. Oh, your uh, example of the red dragon being the last thing that someone mentioned in the flavor text there are there are legendary authors who are very very guilty of this so yeah yeah for sure uh uh rob what about you how do you so when we're talking about the short shadow of the demon lord adventure how are you li- laying that out so we got sure. bullet bullet points uh, but how does that no I'll, I'll put it in the I'll put it in, uh, in, in standard paragraph flow at core text, but I have three rules as far as describing any scene uh, that you go into. If there's an obvious danger, reveal it. Uh, right. Then appeal First. to the then appeal to the player's senses. What do you smell, see, whatever? Think about and, and think carefully about what you remember from any given scene. Vision is important, but that's always going to be one of the things you're going to lean on. Uh, smell is extremely important because you always remember it. Think about the last time you smelled a bag of rotting potatoes. You'll never get rid of that smell, right? 
or uh, discovering the, un the, the unfortunate fates of a bag of onions left in the back of a cupboard. And then you mm. peel that gooey mess off the back yeah. and with the odor that comes <laughs> wafting over you. Or when your cat shits on the floor for because he's sick or she's sick and you have to clean mm. it up and there's all sorts of weird stuff in there. You get all those kind of sensory <laughs> things, right? And then the last thing I do is uh, give you a sense of place. What is, so and I'll, I'll set this up. Uh, so imagine, audience, you're walking into what is obviously a temple of just horrific evil. And you know this because you've seen scenes of such debauchery as to make you sweat. Uh, and I'm not saying that your characters are, but I'm just saying the experience so far has made you all clammy. Moist, one might say. And you open this door, and inside you see that there is a rather corpulent fiend of some mammoth proportions who is straining from his nether regions to push out a glistening sack of fluid and solids that are all squirming about with a, a, a cluster of eyeballs that are pressing against the tissue. And the smell that comes wafting off this thing is one of rancid ham. Like where it's turning green, like it's peeling off the lid. And then you look around this room and you see in this room there's a vaulted ceiling and there's an upside down cross that has been somehow turned upside down by some mad cultist dedicated to Satan. And that you can get from just like three bullets, right? There's a big demon taking the shit and pooping out monsters. The smell is ham, rancid ham, and the sense of place is the filed temple. And that's all you got to do in order to give the audience. Now, there's one thing I will never, ever, 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 ever do is tell the players what they what they feel. Hmm. Never, ever, 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 ever tell the players what they feel. It's your job as a both game master and as a writer to build that in a way that the audience absorbs it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I like that. That's we great. absorbed it. Oh, yeah. We did. You like that? <laughs> yeah. But, Bob, can you tell how we feel right now? I'm never going to get the rancid, rancid hem smell out of my clothes. I absorbed the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the right, rancid. Danny, uh, so, that's uh, that's going to be uh, tough to tough to top. Me? What about you, Danny? Yes, Danny. What about you? Um. I feel like when I when I put together when I write, I tend to write as if I am writing for an audience. Even though to date, I've pretty much written my own stuff for me, but I try to think about it professionally. And I try to write like when I have to write convention rounds for people who are going to be running it, who I'm not necessarily going to know. I do a one page sheet at the very beginning that just says it's all pro advice type stuff. There's no beginners. Because beginners love pro advice and pros love pro advice. So nobody, you don't have to ever write for basic people. Everybody who wants to run a game wants to run it as well as they can. So everybody wants the best mm -hmm. stuff. And then I set the stakes. I just say, this is what's going to happen if you do nothing. And I write that as like one sentence. Like this demon is going to shit out monsters until the fucking cows come home. Unless, the, whatever. And then I set out like what the mood of the place might be but I don't really describe a lot of like specifics. Um, and usually that's enough for me, I would think to create like the, the essential parts of, of setting, setting the scene. People know what there is to lose. They've got a rough idea of like the, the, the air of the place. And then I basically just I list, list, I list a few generalities <laughs> about the place that people can describe if they want. Like, I don't ever do the room size or any of that stuff. I say it's a big room. If people give a shit about how big it is, they'll ask me. If they want to know if there's, you know, I say there's a dripping sound. I don't say it's water. I say there's a dripping sound. Or yeah, I leave it all really ambiguous because, quite frankly, I want the players to go, I bet it's slime. I bet it's slime dripping in that corner. I'm like, fuck, yeah, it is. I never thought of that, but that's a great idea. It's slime, and now it's all over you. You know, so... I, I leave a lot of it in the players' hands to tell me what's terrifying them. I write a lot of horror stuff, too. Um, so I want to know what's scaring them, and then it's easy for me to just turn the dials up. You know, sure. So I would include some random charts or maybe a table or two that says, you know, if the players go in direction A, have more of this creepy shit happen to them. If they go in direction B, give them some clues and some additional creepy shit. You know, 
I keep it real loose. And generally, I think you could write most adventures on two pages um, if you didn't have to worry about the source book material and recreating monster stat blocks and shit like that. Two to four pages, you could write a really good four-hour game. Probably you could write a three-story arc, 12-hour arc on four pages. Nice. nice. Yeah, and uh, Rob, you're getting a lot. I don't know if you're watching the uh, Twitch chat, but you're getting quite a bit of love. Oh, that's sweet. I love you Twitch too. Chat. They're sending you porn. We gave them your address. No, they're getting oh, moist. They're, 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 they're moist. Married. They're getting because moist. my wife and I share a Facebook page. I'm kidding. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> may or may not be telling okay. us. I'm not sure. Uh, Zode and Night Fallen both uh, have been. Yep. Singing your praises from the rooftops, Jimmy. Well, hail, uh, I think you got a hail. There you go. Another hail. What's up? Moist crunchies. Moist crunchies. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You're up, Jimmy. You're up, Jimmy. What am I up for? Oh no. <laughs> your question. Your question. <laughs> I know my question. So well, I'm not the writer in the group here. So go figure. Uh, and, and so, um, but what we talk about with my segments is usually something in the virtual side. And when chatting uh, and we're talking about note taking, which is one of the features I think uh, is underutilized on the virtual side, at least from some of the games that I have DM'd and played in. And so we're chatting in the fantasy ground setup and Matt will slap me around because he'll bring up the roll 20 side. We try not to talk about that. Uh, and so the note sections we're trying to, in the adventure side is the two spots in the fantasy grounds interface. One is the note section in the player character sheet and the other note section, which is in the interface itself and managing those for not in the GM using on the note side to record some of this text information that apparently we don't like in modules because I have seen that I think it's kind of important. There's a mix there. What's that happy medium for some of right. those notes? Okay, for because sure. yeah. our program, we've when we've talked about the inception of doing this, we were trying to help those who are trying to run games. We've seen lots of questions they want to ask, and we're trying not to get other people would slap them down like that's a stupid ass question. And we're going no, no, we want we want to try to provide a platform to answer that. And so I think in the adventure size, yeah, sometimes like if we're more professional and you're comfortable in managing that game, then you only need a few things like Rob was saying, but then there's some of us, we will run a lot of the created modules, but that's what our, our focus is on. And so I don't mind some of that flavor and it's given me enough, then I can build off of it. And I think that we can have a medium in there. And so I just want to say, but on the, but I think that as GMs and even the players to use those sections uh, in a virtual tabletop to put those extra pieces down about your character. Cause I know some of the people are doing it at their tabletop games with their notepads and all that, but on your character and things that happen when you're playing the game, we'll go in there and jot that down because you're going to be looking at it all the time. And same thing on the, on the platform notes interface, GM's put in his notes there to use it. And then you can share those or the characters can actually create public documents so that they can start chatting down about what's going on in the venture and they can then share it with the group. And so you've got those extra things Remember, because if you're not playing, but once a week for a couple hours, a, you know, a session, you're going to forget those sessions behind you and they do it all the time. And I keep trying to push players to continue using that notes interface. So that's my tidbit there for the writing side. That tidbit. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy, if it makes really you good. feel a little better. Yeah. No, go ahead, Matt. No, I was just going to say that's actually a really good conversation starter on uh, virtual tabletop stuff. I'm not sure, Rob, what you've done in that arena yet, but does it make a difference or would it make a difference to you if uh, in, in the way that your adventures were structured on uh, whether or not it was a virtual tabletop with specific ways that a game master can interact that they can't do at the at an actual a real table does it does it make any difference to you as, as i don't know as the way that um, adventures laid out? i think like if i was running call of cthulhu on a virtual tabletop it would be an opportunity for me to present uh props more easily but i i'm i'm so i'm such a luddite when it comes to that uh i i'm really i've done a few virtual tabletop things i, I played the strange with bruce and company and i guess i did uh we used to and when, when i was working with wizards and we would do fifth edition play tests back when it was called D and D next. We would do it all through G plus. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I miss G plus. But anyway, uh, it, it, yeah. I mean, I, I guess it would. I still would go with my three my three rules. What's the What's the thing that's scary? And if there's anything scary there, what's the most obvious thing? I mean, I just think about what human experience is like, right? Where mm -hmm. if you go to the grocery store, you're probably not going to remember the person who checked you out in the grocery aisle unless you went to the self-checkout thing. And then you probably not recognize one of those self-checkout machines for anybody else because you're just going through the motions of living. And yep. if you're going to a dangerous place, uh, you're probably not going to notice the fact that the floor is made of slate rather than granite because you don't give a shit. You're just looking for a thing that's going to kill you. Uh, so I, I just, sure. and, and I, as, as uh, Danny was saying, you let the players guide what information they seek. You could always give more information based on their queries, but keeping enough just to tickle their imagination, to give them a sense of, to immerse them just enough that it drives them to keep asking questions and learn more about their environments. And I think that's where yeah. I get in trouble with read aloud text is that read aloud text doesn't give you the choice. That's valid. Yeah. That's that's probably one of the better arguments that I've heard against it is that you it, it takes that choice out of the game master's hands. It right it puts everything uh, right there on paper. That's a, that's that's a really good argument. Yep. But but don't you think going to Jimmy's point? I'm going to take Jimmy's side in this, and he and I are probably as disparate in our GM styles as you could be. Uh, is that it's always an option? If you include it, it's still an option. I fucking throw it sure. out all the that's, time. That's and true. Yeah. Like Robert yep. said, like Rob said, I I look at it always ironically. <laughs> you <But> know, I, <laughs> I will argue. I will argue though that if you decide you're going to cook dinner you have two choices you can either follow a recipe or make something up based on memory and if you follow a recipe you're more likely to follow the recipe the letter than you are to improvise unless you're experienced yeah sure so yeah. if you're not experienced and then you have a block of read aloud text you're inclined to do it right therefore you're going to read the whole thing aloud yeah, However, maybe so. if you say to the reader and say make this shit up these are the three most important things or four most important things about this location and go from there that will teach the game master up front to embrace the embrace the storytelling side and that's why that's what i'm arguing for i'm not trying to be right or wrong I'm just, right right no 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 and i was i'm not accusing you of that and it, and being no. extemporaneous isn't the point either right i mean you could write down your own notes about what the guy says based on yeah. these yeah right i mm -hmm. mean you just that's what I often do. I look at the yeah. I look at the little notes and I just make something up on my own. Well, so. I, I promise Rob that we're doing some Halloween games starting here in a couple of weeks on both channels, and I will use his format for explaining what the players see as they go through the modules because uh, we're going to be bringing the Cthulhu Mythos in, and so oh, nice. we, okay to the D and D games, uh, and so. Uh, we'll see, and I will, I will make those notes, and from now on, let's see how those run those games, and we'll have it on video, and I'll see if I know what the hell I'm doing. I don't know. So, okay. Are you cool. using Sandy Peterson? Yes, uh, I am. I have, the, I got the book, and so I'm reading it right book. now. So, it's yeah, great, yeah it's and I've already, book. yeah, I've already told the players we're going to factor it in, and madness is in, going to ensue inside these locations, <laughs> and they're called the haunt for a reason. So, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. So. Dude, that's awesome. I didn't know you were doing that. That's yeah, yeah, killer. Yeah. yeah. Brian. All right, guys. So I've got a handful of tips and tricks of my own that I'll share tonight um, when it comes to adventure writing. And these aren't necessarily for publishing, just for having fun, right? So if you're a publisher or you want to publish your own stuff, great. You can probably use these too. But for the most part, it's to have fun with your players and allow your players to have fun. So one of the first things that I, I love to throw out is use of in-media res, Okay. And this means beginning with action, starting the player characters doing something, not necessarily combat, okay? Although combat works fine. You can have them begin immediately in a fight. They're going to they're gonna instantly be excited and having fun, right? Um, but at the same time, I have a, another adventure where the players get um, blamed for a coin shaving operation and they get confronted by the constabulary, that's the beginning of the adventure, okay? So you want to create tension, you want to create excitement, and you want to get people into the story immediately. And I, I think that's a, a strong hint. 
Rob, do you do anything along those lines? Oh yeah, uh, I, I, I'm I'm uh, very much of start you in the middle of shit and try mm-hmm. to find your way out. Right. Uh, you are ambushed by bandits. Uh, you are trying to build a wall to keep the undead from crashing into your room. Uh, you are a fluffer working on a set of a porn movie. What, whatever. You, you've right. got to do something to kind of keep things, to keep the players, so they have something to do immediately, rather than say, you're in a dark tavern, and there is a mysterious uh. man in the corner. He is hatefully masturbating in that corner. <laughs> and of small ah. <laughs> Very That's boring. exactly. Yeah. So uh, speaking of tropes, okay. Oh my God. So I love hate tropes. I th- I love them because they're useful and they're powerful. You know, even if you uh, overly abuse a trope, it still works because it's a trope, right? Yep. Uh, but at the same time, I think you, in order to make them good, you have to twist them. You have to make them your own. You have to own them. So a great uh, tool is to just mix them up, right? You can take an existing trope or, or group of tropes and file off the serial numbers, change things around. Suddenly you have something that everyone can get into because they already kind of understand the power of the trope. And, but now it's your own. So for example, imagine a quest where a bunch of dwarves have to take a giantish artifact that they've stolen to a volcano and have it destroyed by the breath of an ancient red dragon. Okay. It's all right. It's not the greatest story that ever lived, but it is Lord of the Rings with the file, you know, with the serial numbers filed off. It's a thing. You have to take the thing to destroy it. Right. You could take any movie that you loved oh, and yeah. do exactly that. And suddenly you look like a great game master coming up with this amazing storyline that your players really love. And then later, 10 years later, you can be like, oh, yeah, I totally just ripped that off. Yeah, I, I used to start game. I played a, uh, an Oriental Express game, and I always started it the same way. You felt the tracks giving way about five seconds ago. And in the time mm-hmm. it took for you to, to take action, everybody roll initiative now. Everybody rolls initiative. Uh, the, 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 the bridge was already giving way, and the train is plummeting. And then the game starts. So everybody's got to figure out what they do. And most people, I mean, people do all sorts of crazy shit in situations like that. And the main thing is it doesn't have to be combat. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a fight, right, Brian? I mean, it can be an encounter. It can be... Absolutely. Hello? Hmm? What? What? Hmm? Hello? I was just going to say, I I don't think, I don't think, I think that's why I like the word encounter so much when that really came into common parlance, because now it, every time I think about a fight, I think about it like an encounter where a fight might happen, not as a combat encounter or something like that. It's just, it's just an encounter. Something could happen. One of which might be a fight. And then the last thing that I, I try to always incorporate is think about your players and That's if you're a game master running something off the cuff. But if you're a publisher, think about all the classes, all the roles, if you will. Um, People play a particular class because they enjoy the things that that class can do. Fighters want to fight. Rogues want to sneak. They want to backstab. Clerics want to turn undead. Paladins want to hold back the hordes while their friends rush to safety, right? So, you know, you, you need to write for the GM and the players, you have to give the players those opportunities to do those cool, amazing things that they want to do so that they can be the heroes of the story. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I remember flavor text used to be put in for the GM. I don't remember what they were from. I think they're from all old TSR modules. They say fighters will enjoy this module because they will get the chance to fight Grognard, the hill giant king. And, you know, magic users will enjoy the many magical challenges at the tower. And I think that kind of stuff is great. You, you, I mean, in terms of like letting people know there's a little mm-hmm. bit of here, something here for everybody. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I guess I that's a, that's a pretty important aspect of oh, adventure yeah, design, right? How do you, how do you, how do you provide things for everybody to do? Is that a consideration? Right. I mean, it is for you, Brian. But I mean, does everybody yeah. consider that? 
I think it depends on the game. I mean, if you are in a D&D game where there is an expectation that characters are so distinct that you have to cater to the particular place. I mean, it's more of a, I think it's more of a fourth edition mentality where you want to make sure that your striker is going to have an opportunity to do something cool and your leader mm-hmm. is going to do something cool as well. But I don't think Cthulhu worries about that so much, right? Right. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And now there's Warhammer Fantasy role play because that's the story that you're navigating, I think. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't think I, I I don't I don't give a lot of consideration and maybe to a fault in some cases. I don't give a lot of consideration to who's gonna be in the group, I think. Hmm. I think there's there's I think there's probably gonna have to be I think it's good to think about that, but I think that that also could lead to madness. That sure, don't be a slave to it. Yeah. In every adventure, you have to make sure that you have at least one history check. Right, because right, right. Somebody <laughs> decided they want to take history instead of perception for whatever reason. Yeah. History right. fluffers, by, by the way. Right. <laughs> fluffers wanted to make agree. That's what happened. To the <laughs> I wanted to make sure that uh, that you knew, Rob, that Stephen outed you and mentioned that uh, before your job as a McDonald's manager that you were a, a professional fluffer. I was, mm-hmm. uh, but not for what you expect. I was an elephant fluffer uh, at ah, well. at the Baltimore Zoo trying to make sure that elephants mated. Uh, I was I was favored for my supple wrists and gentle hands. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. Requested, yeah, you know, I heard, yeah. Many an elephant was uh, left that scene pleased one way or the other. Yeah, and you know I can't elephant. tell what's truth or fiction it's anymore. Yeah, I can't either. He, he will. He weaves a spellbinding tale. He does. That's, that's <laughs> I do. <laughs> Beth is very happy that uh, her kids went. Her kid went upstairs. <laughs> yes. Good plan, Beth. Love you. <laughs> 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 just in case we didn't just in case we didn't uh, uh say it earlier it is an adult show uh we're, we're liable to say and robert uh rob has really like raised that bar oh, i think yeah. i mean or lowered I it brought up milking the prostate yet <laughs> that's true yep there we go all right thank you everybody thanks, thanks everybody. Rob. we'll see you